time of war, a fleet can only operate efficiently if its base is defended in such a way as to provide security and thus confidence and rest. These images are from the coast defence of South Africa in 1943, but apart from the presence of female artillerymen, <coughs> artillery personnel, these were the same types of installations defending the Firth of Forth through half a century. The memory is fading that the Firth of Forth was once filled with the ships of the British Grand Fleet and was at one time the most important naval base in the British Empire. And so it was under the guns of Inchkeith that the German high seas fleet surrendered in November 1918 before going to Scarpa Flow to be interned. During both the First and Second World Wars, the Fourth was the site of the only relatively bomb-free Royal Dockyard and the place from which strong naval forces could challenge the German Navy in the North Sea. My colleague Ron Morris and I have been working in recent years to investigate the remains of the defences of the Fourth on the ground and in the archives. The archives are a treasure trove not only of written information but also dozens of detailed Royal Engineer drawings of the battery sites. Some of them from the period before the First World War, like this one here, works of art in their own right. For most of the batteries, there was what was called the Fort Record Book, and this survives, incorporating a wide range of information about the history and operations of the batteries. And the papers of the Committee of Imperial Defence the War Office and the Admiralty provide the wider historical and strategic context. From the First World War onwards, aerial photography also provides unique insights into the development of the batteries. Our lavishly illustrated account of the defences has been accepted for publication by the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland, and we in the Society are currently trying to raise funds, the funds necessary to publish the book uh, next year before the centenary of the armistice in November 19, 1918. Um, any incognito millionaires in the audience should perhaps make themselves known later. In the book we describe not only what was built and what survives, but also the strategic and tactical context in which the defences were built and used. It's not possible in a short lecture to thank uh, everybody who has helped us, but we wish to acknowledge gratefully our British Academy Lever Hume Research Grant. Today we can only provide a glimpse of our research and maybe dismiss a myth or two, for example that the island of Inchmickery was deliberately designed to look like a ship. Despite recognition that the fourth was an important commercial port, it was not until 1879 that the government finally started to defend the river. Gun batteries were built on Inchkeith and at Kinghorn which would remain in service until the coast defences were disbanded in the 1950s. The first guns mounted at Inchkeith and King Horn were 10-inch muzzle loaders, already becoming obsolete at that time, as the first breech-loading 6-inch gun was adopted by the Royal Navy in the same year. Four guns covered the North Channel, the main channel into the river between Inchkeith and King Horn and two covered the South Channel, the shallower route to Leith Roads and Leith Docks. The inadequacy of the defences was acknowledged by the end of the decade and they were strengthened during the 1890s as a nationwide upgrading uh, uh, of coast batteries. The replacement of the 10-inch guns on inch Keith with 9.2-inch and 6-inch breech-loading guns began in 1893 and was completed in 1903 the same year in which the last 10-inch muzzle-loading guns in the 4th at Kinghorn were replaced. One of the many misunderstandings about the defences is that their primary role was to protect Resyth Dockyard and the 4th Rail Bridge. While these were indeed defended as potential targets for enemy bombardment, the defences were designed primarily to protect the expanse of open water inside the defences, the naval anchorage, and the valuable ships moored there. Construction of Resyth only began in 1909, and by then the defences of the Fourth had already reached their first, their pre-First World War peak, and had actually declined in strength. This is a chart 
of the uh, warship moorings in the upper estuary in 1913, showing how densely packed the moored ships were at that time. And as you will see later, this was only the beginning. The guns were not the only form of defence, uh, even in the late 19th century. Between 1880 and 1903, submarine mining was a key weapon in the fourth. Operators on shore, observing an enemy ship enter what was called the controlled minefield, could remotely detonate one or more groups of mines to destroy the vessel. Such minefields were initially used to control the channels at Inchkeith. Controlled mining was reintroduced in 1915 and used until the end of the Second World War. Smaller guns were needed to stop enemy steamers clearing the Inchkeith minefields out of the way, and 4.7 inch breech loading, quick firing guns were mounted at both Kinghorn and Inchkeith in the 1890s. The only line of defence was at Inchkeith and Kinghorn until the turn of the century, when an inner line was established just below the rail bridge. A controlled minefield was established, protected by batteries of guns at, from south to north, Dalmeny, Inchgarvie, Coast Guard and Carling Nodes. This original chart shows the controlled minefield in blue and a contact minefield running across it in red. The contact minefield could be switched off and on from a control post uh, at the north coast. The coast defences had continually to be redesigned to deal with new threats, such as faster and more, ever, more heavily armed ships, uh, more powerful guns, fast torpedo boats, and submarines. Re-equipping the coast defence was very expensive and their purely defensive uh, role was always seen as less attractive for funding than more, uh, more active parts of the armed forces. Shortage of funding meant that new batteries or guns might only be put in place a decade after they had been planned and by then yet further new developments might have made the original proposals obsolete. In the fourth, Construction programmes planned in one year might not be completed until four or five years later. In the first years of the, the 20th century, the British fleet was becoming so large that, to put it crudely, it was running out of places to park its ships and too big to maintain using the existing dockyards in southern Britain. In 1903, the fourth was chosen as the site of a new naval base capable of housing and maintaining a fleet in the North Sea against the growing threat of German naval expansion. Construction was not, however, begun until 1909 after a great deal of controversy and arguing about cost. This chart shows the arcs of fire of the various guns in the outer and inner defences, as in Keith, King Horn, and the defences around the bridge. The defences of their fourth reached their pre-First World War peak in the period 1903 to 1905, but not as is widely believed as a result of the decision to build Rosyth. The new batteries completed or upgrading at that time, or upgraded at that time, had been planned or begun well before 1903. After 1906, the defences of the river were actually reduced. This is not the place to describe the struggle between the two predominant schools of defence current at that time. Suffice it to say that the Blue Water School, which believed that Britain needed nothing apart from a strong navy to defend the home country, was in the ascendant. The fleet, it was claimed, could prevent any major attack on the coast. The coast artillery was therefore portrayed as too expensive, inflexible and passive a weapon on which to, to spend limited defence funds. Consequently, in 1905, the Owen Committee, which is a sort of coast defence beaching report, recommended radical reductions in coast artillery. In the fourth, most of the medium six-inch and light 12-pounder guns were removed, leaving only a total of eight guns to defend the estuary. This is the equivalent um, map from 1907. By the autumn of 1907, the Admiralty realised, however, that the lighter guns at the Fourth Bridge, which had been decommissioned but not actually removed by the Owen Report, the Owen Committee, were necessary to protect the anchorage above the bridge from torpedo boats, which were seen as a growing threat after the um, 
Russo-Japanese War. And the lighter guns of the inner defences were reinstated. At this stage, however, the Admiralty did not believe that submarines posed a threat to its anchorages and bases because of their short range and unreliability at that time. However, in 1913, the reality of the threat posed by submarines was demonstrated when a submarine travelled from here, from Dundee, submerged past all the defences of the Firth of Forth, up to the, the, the dockyard construction site at Recife and the naval anchorage outside it at St Margaret's Hope, and then returned to base without having been detected. <laughs> Henceforth, the defences would have to take account of this new threat. At the outbreak of the First World War, the defences of the river were much as they had been in 1907, although work was already underway to add two new heavy guns braces here beside the oil terminal um, for Mosmoran. <clears throat> the conversion of Inch Garvey, the island in the middle of the river beneath the fourth bridge to take four four inch guns and the construction of new 4.7 inch and six inch batteries at Downing Point and Hound Point. When it became clear that the war was not going to be over by Christmas 1914, the first serious steps were taken to protect the anchorage of the fourth, and uh, including the need to provide additional moorings downstream from the bridge. Sorry. This map shows the situation once all the batteries had been completed or upgraded in the first part of the war, and the anti-submarine defences, the various booms and barriers built uh, by about 19, late 1915, early 1916. Anti-submarine nets were placed beneath the two spans of the fourth bridge to protect the anchorage west, that is upstream of the bridge. And at the same time, a new defence line was established across the river uh, using the, uh, uh, the islands to protect the new moorings east of the bridge. That's the line that ran across Inchcombe, uh, Inchmickery, Cramond Island. Ah. I'm so sorry, that uh, has failed to register. I don't know why. What you should see here is um, the moorings, uh, 100 moorings above the river here, and 28 moorings provided between the bridge and the Inchcombe line. The Inchcombe line comprised a complex of nets and booms to prevent submarines from passing upriver, and in front of it were controlled minefields. During the first half of the war, the fourth was the base of the Grand Fleet's battle cruiser squadron, as well as being the main port of the British minesweepers working in the North Sea. In early 1916, it was decided that the main body of the Grand Fleet would move its operational anchorage from Scarpa Flow in Orkney yeah. Uh, to the fourth, as it would be closer to the likely areas of operation of the German high seas fleet based at Wilhelmshaven, uh, particularly if the Germans repeated their 1914 raids on towns on the English coast, as indeed they did in February 1916. Now, if you remember back to the 1903 and the 1905, 1907 charts showing the gun arcs. Each one of these represents the arc of fire of the gun. So this is the situation um, consequent upon the decision to move the, grand, the, 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 the British fleet from Scarpa Flow to the fourth. Uh, you can see that you can actually hardly distinguish. There are so many guns now that it is difficult to see what fires where. For over a year, from April 1916, the batteries were the scene of a colossal effort to upgrade the defences as the relatively simple batteries put in place on the island line in Chacombe and so on um, uh, were completely rebuilt as far more complex permanent structures. There was a general shift of the heavier guns outwards from batteries in here and the lighter guns in towards the bridge. New batteries were built at Leith Docks uh, down here and at Petit Kerr up beside the Kinghorn batteries. 
A more extensive series of obstructions was also built to prevent submarines and surface vessels reaching the anchorage, including a barrier between Granton and Black Rock at Burnt Island. This one here. Um, you can see that actually these, um, the, the dashed line is actually where the barrier is built onto the bottom of the, the river, which isn't as deep as it looks over most of its width. These defences provided yet more moorings, in this case mainly for the auxiliary vessels of the fleet. So you can see that basically the fourth um, is an enormous ship park all the way in from uh, <coughs> west of Inch Keith. Uh, I don't know what's happened to my photographs. Um, this shows a section of the barrier being built out towards Inch Keith the boom the piles being driven into the bottom. Uh, this one, unfortunately missing, shows uh, drifters holding up part of the floating elements of the net in, over the deeper channels. This is anti-torpedo net, this very small gauge netting hung from the what are called dolphins, these towers. Gates were provided for ships to pass safely through. Um, you can see the dolphins here, and this is the orange painted gate ship and a sailing vessel coming through. Oh, for God's sake. Okay. Um, I don't know what's happened. Uh, Okay. Um, hydrophones were placed in four lines at the mouth of the estuary to listen for the sounds of submarines, and there were also anti submarine nets. The so called Fidra Gap, which, is, which you couldn't see on the map, could be closed temporarily using nets towed by trawlers to provide a safe area for the fleet to exercise. After the armistice in 1918, the defences were run down quickly. Between the First and Second World Wars, the strategic centre of gravity moved away from the North Sea, where there was seen to be little threat from a defeated Germany and a Russia in chaos. In the 1920s, British war planning was actually directed against a potential threat from France, with its immense bomber fleet. Largo Bay was identified as a major convoy mustering and unloading point in any future war a role that did actually serve in the, in the Second World War. Coast defence in general stagnated between the wars. Uh, in the fourth, the defences of the middle line on the islands of Inchcombe, Inchmickery and Cramond had been dismantled by 1931. And it was not until 1938, as the international situation began to deteriorate, that planning began to reinstate the defences. The last battery of the inner defences, the Coast Guard battery at the Fourth Bridge, was disarmed at, that at this time, and from now on the innermost defences would lie across the river between Cramond Island, Inchmickery, Inchcombe, and a new battery on the Fife Coast at Charles Hill. This included building the concrete anti-boat barrier between Cramond Island and the mainland, as it is now and it being built with the, the temporary floating anti-submarine, sort of anti-boat barrier across the sands here. Late in the war, a method had been developed to detect vessels, <laughs> including submerged submarines, passing over a cable on the seabed. And one of the first of these guard loops, as they were known, deployed in conjunction with controlled mines, sank a U-boat trying to enter Scarpa Flow in 1918. Here you have the detector loop is being laid round the mine. So you can tell when a submarine submerged enters the minefield and you blow the mines in sections of 16, uh, 16 mines at a time. That is. By 1939, the technology had matured and guard loops and mine loops were laid in the fourth uh, uh, in, just before the war. Goodness. Um, there was an outer complex of 12 guard loops at the Isle of May to detect, uh, to, to provide early warning of a submarine, and naval patrol vessels would investigate any alarms. And new batteries were built at King Cray and near Durleton, uh, here, to provide 
uh, gun defence in the outer part of the fourth. This is the Fidra battery. It wasn't actually on the island of Fidra. It was on the mainland. And the, the, batteries, the guns were hidden inside canvas shelters painted to look like um, cottages. The same uh, camouflage was provided at Berwick upon Tweed, actually. The Kincraig battery, uh, which is not on this map, it was further out, was the... Uh, uh, was, was to pr protect the convoy anchorage in Largo Bay and was provided with the most modern six inch guns in the river and was also the only one eventually to have gun control radar so it could actually fire in the dark and, and, uh, uh, and in uh, heavy weather. The strongest defences were concentrated upriver. <coughs> There's a series of guard and mine loops closing the river against submarines at Inch Keith, and also a boom to stop um, fast boats uh, crashing through um, uh, into, the, into the anchorage. The defences absorbed large numbers of personnel. Inch Keith in the, sec in the Second War had a garrison of over 1,100 at its peak, including a dozen women of the ATS who travelled out every day from Leith. Just a map showing the complexity of all the structures on Inch, uh, of, uh, on Inch Keith in the, the Second World War. <coughs> the inner line across the islands was guarded by a mixture of 12 pounder guns from the 1890s, um, which were still very efficient weapons, and specially designed fast firing six pounder guns with a twin barrel. Um, uh, sorry, I've missed a point. So, this is the inner defence with the anti submarine and anti boat booms. Uh, from Charles Hill Battery to Inchcombe, the gate through the booms here, and um, nets further up the river so that torpedoes fired into the gate while it was open would be caught. Thank you. These are the guns. This is the six pounder twin. Uh, these six pounders never saw action in the fourth, but in Malta in July 1941, guns of the same type sank nine Italian e-boats in two minutes, so they're quite good. Um, the coast artillery was run down at the end of the war and finally made obsolete by more modern weapons and closed in the 1950s. In the fourth, however, it was only in 1977 that the Admiralty gave up the two boom anchors on Inchcombe, the things for mounting the anti-submarine boom, which are still preserved on the island. The privatisation of the Royal Dockyard in 1997 and the subsequent slow decline of the naval presence of the fourth marks the end of a century in which the fourth played a key part in Britain's naval defence. Much survives of the defences and many sites are accessible, although many are also very dangerous places. The surviving remains offer an opportunity which we hope will be taken up to tell the story of the defence of the fourth. In the inner defences, the Dalmeny battery, having been carefully restored by its current owner, is to become the Fourth Bridge Visitor Centre and network rail assure us that their plans include preservation and interpretation of the battery. The First World War Downing Point battery is now in the hands of a very active local management group who've done a great deal to clear and conserve the site. Hound Point is accessible to the walker with care, as is the 9.2 inch battery at Bray Food. On the middle line, the Cram and Island defences of the Second War are accessible to visitors. Charles Hill is, a, uh, is accessible on foot and has surviving anti-torpedo net uh, piled up on the beach. In Schmickery, although impressive, is not safely accessible. In Schcombe, where part of the island is in the care of Historic Environment Scotland and the rest leased to them, offers perhaps the greatest opportunity to display defence structures of both wars, including a uniquely surviving wooden hut, and metal fittings in the searchlight housings, most of which elsewhere have been removed. Ron Morris and I are working with Historic Environment Scotland to improve the interpretation of these sites. In the outer defences, King Inchkeith is, is dangerous to visit. The Leith Docks battery was swept away a long time ago, and Kinghorn is reduced to the survival of fragments, including a loophole defensive wall and the only searchlight housing in the river where the steel shutters are still in place. 
Our time is up. Uh, Ron and I hope that we have given you a taste of the richness and significance of these monuments to the history of the river and the defence of Britain. We hope that our research will, invade, will aid the conservation and interpretation of what remains. And next year, we hope to be at the conference selling copies of our book. Thank you very much. <laughs>